and welcome back to the Woodwright Shop. I'm Roy Underhill. And of all the things I have made in my life, there are few things that I have enjoyed making more than this. And I've enjoyed, I don't know which is better, in making it or playing with it. This is a boxwood recorder, a very easy instrument to play. Here, listen. easy to play so this is what instrument that a lot of people begin on it's also a good instrument to begin learning how to make wind instruments but it's not all that easy as you will see but I'm gonna show you how to make one it's in two well here let's see how the pieces are I've got a piece of paper wrapped around to make it join up tighter actually I'll replace that with thread but this is the way it is it's a jointed instrument you can see there's the uh, top the whistle part right here and there's the a uh, little fipple out of um, red cedar in there. You can see the wind way that, that conducts the air down to the sharp uh, lip right there in the mouth. And here's a socket where the bottom part goes in. And the bottom, of course, is just uh, uh, has finger holes in it to control the length of the vibrating air column, and that's what controls the tone. Now, I've cheated a little bit. This bottom is a fake. Uh, it's all one piece here on the bottom. Normally, this would be jointed right here, but the joints are actually the most difficult part of the whole thing, so I have skipped that right there. So, how do we begin? Well, you gotta go find the wood. This is boxwood, and if you know boxwood, it's that ornamental um, uh, bush that there's English and American box, but they both got uh, leaves on them the size of a mouse's ear, evergreen, and uh, it's, well, here, here's a piece. You'll recognize it when you see it. It's uh, little soft green leaves little uh, bark, very scaly, but light colored. And you can see this piece right here, very, very dense cream colored wood like ivory. Now this piece is almost 100 years old and it's dried for about eight years. Now this is exactly what you want. You can get this beautiful uh, look to it. This is, in fact, this is the blank that I would turn the uh, top piece out of for this recorder but it's very, very hard wood and difficult to work. Not a good one for the first time recorder maker. So, what else could you look for? Another good wood is uh, persimmon. Or, uh, if you haven't got persimmon, try pear wood or apple wood, but any very dense wood is going to do fine. Something that's dried for a good while so it's good and stable. Now, I've got some out of pear wood, and that's what I'm going to work with right now. I'll tell you what to make it out of, and I'll tell you what we're making and how to do it, but I'm not going to tell you the measurements because that's not how you do it. One of the things you're gonna have to do as we go along through this, I'm gonna cleave out this piece, is you're gonna have to find a recorder to copy because that's really the only way to get the measurements. Now here, I'm just busting out a piece of pear to make that top. That's all you have to do is cleave out blocks like this, put them aside to let them dry, and then you're gonna start boring them. But the sizes, the dimensions, as I'm saying, the dimensions are tough, and you really need to have one right there with you uh, to copy it. And this is the way all instrument makers really work. They don't sit there with a list of uh, dimensions and do it. Of course, they just look at one and copy it and make another one and improve it and test and copy each one, and it grows in that way. So that's in the tradition of making them. But here, I'll show you all the tricks that we have to go through. We got to bore a hole, all right? We got to bore a socket hole down here, of course, the socket hole to take the foot. So we want to bore that hole. And then we've got to bore the fipple bore, which is a little smaller. That has a red cedar filler in there right now, so it looks a little odd, but that's a smaller diameter hole. And I've got a piece here somewhere that I've already started boring. Now, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here it is. All right, I've already bored the big hole in it. And I'm gonna put it here in the hole fast and finish up boring the bottom hole. Now, this is not the kind of auger that would have been used in the year 1600 when they, for these uh, became real popular in England, the recorder did. Uh, this is a regular Jennings bit I'm boring with, a little spiral auger. Oh, there, I think I'm already through. All right, not much to it, but you can do it. You can bore through the, the grain all the way down from one end to the other using these kind of spiral augers. Although there's another kind, as you'll see when we bore the foot, that's actually preferable to this. For the short run, we can do that. All right, let's take it on over there to the lathe now, because this is a turned item. We are turning this on the lathe. I'm gonna stick this paper back in here to make that join up tighter. And now, how are we gonna fit this in the lathe? I got the spring pole lathe here and two holes in it. Now, how, what, the reason we bored these holes first is we want to, you can't tell where these holes are gonna come out, really. So you start with them as your center line. They form the axis of the piece. You then fit it in the lathe and turn concentric 
to those holes that you bored. So you trim it down a little bit here. Uh, you can see how I've trimmed this one a little bit to get more centered, get closer in. And then just keep doing that until you get down to a piece uh, that you can put in the lathe. Now you can see here's one that I've started roughing in the lathe. And what I've done to mount it in the lathe, I've turned mandrels here. You can see this one's been used in a mandrel driven foot wheel lathe here, but you can use it on any kind of lathe. And this other end here is going to get one too. See, this is the first trick you have to do. You bore the hole first, then put these plugs in the end like this. And I have to wrap paper around this one to make it tight. Put plugs in the end and then mount the whole rig in the lathe. You can see how I've got the leather strap that runs the lathe that does the turning around the front side and then those two mandrels. So that's the trick. You tap it all up and now you've got it. See, you've got this, the holes bored through the center. You've got the mandrels holding the ends and now it's perfectly concentric to there and so now you're ready to start turning. So you're copying one, so another tool you need is to have dividers. Let me make sure I'm on the correct end. Yeah, this is the correct end. All right, I'm going to take this one. Here's the one that I borrowed from somebody or one that was made by great-grandfather or however you're doing it. Uh, and I'm copying it, now transferring the measurement to here. All right, now I need to set my divider. Let's see, no, I'm sorry, my compass. My, what am I saying? My calipers. <laughs> Set the calipers to this dimension right here. All right. And then I'll be able to turn down to that dimension. Let me get the uh, cutoff tool here. And I'll turn down to the dimension that I have just copied. Let's see if I can. This is tough for me to do because I have got to have one hand on the. Well, I'll just do it like this. See how that works? All right, now I'm going to check it with the calipers. Usually I like to have one hand on the calipers and one hand on the cutoff tool. I think I'm right. There we go. All right, now we're right in there. All right, now I can begin my turning. I'm going to cut a little annulet right there. Well, I'll tell you what, though. Before I do, I'm going to put on some music. Okay. Uh, this lady, Michla Petrie, does a real nice recorder, uh, virtuoso recorder playing. I have got a record of hers that I enjoy a lot, and I'm sure you will too. It's good music for turning. It's nice to do. Let me choose a gouge here. Yes, ready? There you go. So now I'm just copying this right here, copying this section. I need both hands to do it though. Yeah, nice. See what a great project this is to work on, I think, because everybody likes wood turning, and if you like music too, what more could you ask for? This is a great combination. Nope, don't turn your head while you're doing this. Let me get in there a little better. All right, I'm going to get the sizing tool and cut myself a little bead right here. or, you know, rough out the bead. There we go. All right, now get in there with the gouge again. There we go. We gotta finish up here. Here goes the music. All right, let's see if I can get the skew in there. Nope, I didn't make it. All right, well, all right, I think you get the idea. What you got to do is turn it down until you get a piece. Uh, let's see, I've got one down here. Whoop. Uh, get a piece. This is, again, in pair. And you can see the difference between the pear and the boxwood. Now, both of these I have covered with beeswax by uh, rubbing the beeswax on it and then spinning it real fast, holding my hand against it until the beeswax melts into both the hand and the wood. But the, the uh, boxwood will age a beautiful brown color, and the, the pear is nice, too, but not near as nice as the box. All right. So you get the thing, you got the holes through it, you get the thing turned down. Now you've got to cut the mouth, and that's the little opening that um, uh, goes, you know, that's what, this is the mouth right here. The mouth is uh, right there. This is the mouth, you've got two mouths there. And these, that's the opening. You can see my mouths are a little bit too big, a very critical aspect of this. Uh, so be sure to measure uh, carefully uh, the one that you're going to do. Now, just 
get a drill then and drill the holes to make the mouth. That's all you have to do. And the way I'm going to hold this too, I've got a neat little thing here. I've got a kind of a foot uh, operated rope that holds the stuff down. See, it grabs and holds it down real tight up on top. Ah! See? All right. This is a scrap piece here. This is one that I trashed earlier. I messed up. I'm not going to be able to use it, so I'm going to go ahead and cut the mouth and do the work on this. Because it's, it's rough. You've got to really take care with this thing. But I know you'll enjoy it. Uh, and it's easier, easier to do when you've got one there and just copy it. But you'll see there are a lot of tricks coming up that you have to go through. And things you may not notice, subtleties to this. Uh, the fella is uh, writing about this an amateur wind instrument maker uh, saying this is really one of the most difficult instruments to make well. So <laughs> that'd be a lesson to you. All right, two holes cut into it right there to make the mouth and just chisel it square, make the rectangular mouth, copying the one that you have borrowed or rented. You could get an instrument store to rent you one. You could get antique ones. You can get into it. What's neat is you make one, and then you can always just make them better. There's so much to this. And pretty soon you'll graduate to making other instruments. Now this one, I could say I trashed it. This is, I broke it. That does not make it a Baroque recorder. It is a broken recorder. There you are. See? So there's the mouth. There's the mouth opening. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Now. The mouth opening is just one of the rectangular holes. We've got another one that we have to cut, which is uh, the windway. And I think you can see, yeah, here, you can see the windway in this one right here. It's a rectangular slot there on the bottom of the tube. It's a little hard to see because it's dark inside there, but it's a rectangular slot that leads up to the mouth. So that, let me show you on the boxwood one as well. Here, I'll pop that off. The, uh, you can see there's a rectangular slot on top of the fipple that leads up to the uh, uh, mouth there. And you can see the light coming through the mouth right there. You can't on this one. But you've got to chisel that in there now. Again, very, very careful work. You have to have a sharp chisel in order to do this. You need a chisel that's the same width as the uh, mouth opening. So you can do it in one go. Now here I've got one uh, set up, ready to go. Here I've got the mouth already cut in this one. And very, very careful. You can see, see the mouth there. Look at the end now, it's perfectly round. Now what I'm gonna do is just start cutting this wind way or flue like this. And boy, you don't wanna slip because you'll ruin either the, your hand or the, uh, or the recorder. You see, just working it down there. Pretty soon you'll start seeing the blade flash by inside. See that? That's how you do it. You gotta chisel that slot all the way down the top. You do it enough to make a flat slot, because even though you're boring a round hole for that, as most holes that you bore are, uh, you, for the, the fipple, which is the filler piece in there, you've got to have a rectangular section where that goes through the, uh, now just hold the chisel steady and slide the recorder down onto it. See how that works? It takes a lot of pressure, particularly in the boxwood, to have the kind of control that you need, but you've got to get it flat all the way down on there. All right, let's see what we've got here. I don't know if you can see inside there, but you can see I'm cutting a, like a keyway, I guess, in mechanics. You can see a slot going down to meet the mouth. Right. Now, come around from the back side now and flatten out the roundness on the other side of the mouth. You just cut just enough to take the roundness out. You can, again, see the blade flashing by there. But you've got to just take that roundness out just enough to do it. All right. Very nerve-wracking, but easy enough to do once you get into it. All right, so cut that mouth down there. I think I've got it. All right. Now, having gotten this far and not trashed it, and you've got an easy thing to do. You got to turn the fipple. Now, you got a technical problem though. Here's a the fipple wood inside the uh, uh, whistle part. And what happens? You know, when you play these things, of course, there's a lot of moisture involved. This is just the way people are. And what would happen if this started absorbing moisture and started swelling, of course, it would crack this thing open like an exploding uh, boiled egg or something like that. It, you'd ruin the whole thing. And it would indeed be a Baroque uh, recorder. So you have to choose the right kind of wood for down here. I don't know if you can see what that is. Let me get another piece of it here. You see what kind of wood that is? This is red cedar. You could smell it if you had smell-o-vision. Red cedar is what you use in there, and it will not absorb a lot of moisture and swell up and crack. 
So that's what we need to use. You turn it down, turn a cylinder to make your fipple. But again, as you can see, very, it's kind of hard to see, but it's not round, it's flattened. You can see right there through the mouth. You can see it's flattened on top. And there's actually a little slip of wood of red cedar glued on top of that to help raise that uh, opening in the windway a little bit. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to cut a flat on here and then glue on a very thin, flat strip of wood. All right? All right, let's do that. Let's do that. It's a little easier to do because the red cedar is so much softer and easier to work with. I've got a lot of pieces here. But this, look how nice the red cedar works. Of course, it's just a neat wood. He said, too soon. Look at it splintering off. I'll just let that splinter all the way off. It does tend to splinter. Just a chisel a flat. This is the recorder. I don't know where the name recorder came from. It sure is a neat instrument. You can, and what you'll find, of course, if you don't take any lesson, if you just uh, teach yourself how to play, that all those nursery rhymes are, are so well suited for it. It's a very, I don't know why that is, whether the nursery rhymes were just written for these kind of instruments. So anyway, there it is with the flat on. You can see now it's got a flat and it's cylindrical otherwise. And to make that very thin piece to go on top, again, with a piece of red cedar, you got to split this thing into a real thin strip. You know how to do it. Don't you? I hope you do. This is what you do. Take it and hold it right between your fingers and take your chisel and set the chisel right on top in the middle and kind of hold it right there like that. Now, you don't want to go down like that and have it go through your thumb. You want to tap like this and just let that split run right down there. There you go. Very, very thin piece. Let's see if we can get it even thinner here. You can do real thin work. Of course, there's not too much point to this. But do split the wood out to make that. Look how thin that is. You can put that on diamond reed in God we trust through that. That's something. You take that and then glue that to the top of this piece, and that is your fipple is complete. There you are. Let me see. I've got a finished one here. A finished fipple back here. A very thin strip of wood glued on there. That's the way it looks when you're all, all done. All right. Now. You got your fipple, you can put it in there, it has to be very carefully sized, and then you can, well, let me see, Let's see if I've got one here. All right, you've got to cut the, uh, what's called the lip. Now, it's a final stage, you want to cut the sloping lip that goes down to that point. See, I haven't got that little slope that makes the sharp edge there, so I'm going to move this one out of the holder, put this one in, and cut that final thing. Then we'll put the fipple in and see how it plays. See how it plays, and I hope I can. Got to have a real sharp chisel. If your chisel is not sharp and you tear this thing up, because here is where you've got to have a sharp ending. You can't have any kind of fuzziness to your work at all. Set this on the side. So here's the critical point. Everything you've been doing is leading up to this. You mess up here, it's ruined forever. You have to turn it in. No, you don't. You just go start again. And if you do mess up, really, uh, do something that makes you feel good in, in between. I, I've messed up enough times to know that you've got to reward yourself. Do something that you'll know you succeed because then you can build on that. You think of at least you've succeeded in getting this far. But don't feel bad. Here's You have to be careful, though. You get that right down good and sharp. Good and sharp right to that point. And then stop, because if you enlarge that too much, and I'm getting a little sloppy here, but that's how you have to do it. All right, all right. Okay, there's the trash one, here's the finished one. Yeah, all right, that's what we want it to look like when we're done. It's still a little rough in there, but this is the point where you stop, you take the thing out, and you can put the uh, fipple, where'd it go? Fipple, put the fipple in and try it out. So this is it, I'm gonna slide that in there, and watch how this goes. And you see, should see it just appear inside the mouth there. That's it. I think it's a little too far. We can try it out. All right, this is the test. And by tapping this in or out, we will be able to tell if we have got something that will work. All right, that's it. Now, you can tap that. I love it when it works. You can tap it in. And out, because sometimes you can fiddle with these things, you can't figure out what the heck is wrong. I'm going to take that out a little bit. <laughs> See, it's a little too breathy. A little bit more. <laughs> All right, now that sounds right. All right, 
Now, we've got one note, we've got the whistle, but we've got to make that bottom part now, the foot of the recorder. What you gotta do is make a tapered cylinder. And this should have thread around it, not paper around it to make it fit. But that's gonna fit into that whistle now. So we're gonna make this bottom part. And it has a tapered uh, hollow inside it going down to the end. So what we'll do, and it's also too long to bore at one go. So what we will do is actually put this in the lathe and bore the hole in the lathe using the oldest trick in the wood turner's book. A neat thing that you can do is called, uh, I don't know what you call it, but it's uh, using a hollow center to bore, a hollow center to bore out something long. And people who make uh, lamps do this, but it's mainly a trick used by instrument makers for doing exactly what we're going to do right here. And this is how you do it. Very cheap trick to pull. <laughs> this is a plumbing fixture, a brass plumbing tee, a half inch diameter tee. You can see it's a half inch in diameter through the middle and it's just a plumbing tee. It was threaded on both ends and what I did, I just put it on a, a lathe with a, a shaft through here and it was spinning around. Very dangerous, but then you, you sharpen the ends to a good conical point that the wood can gr sit on and spin on that conical, uh, not conical, but hollow center like that. All right, so this becomes the hollow center and you pass the drill through that. Well, let me show you instead of talking about it. But it's an old trick and it works real well. So of course, all you have to do is take your pear or boxwood piece that you want, rough it out, and you put it in the lathe like this. And here you can see how that center is going to engage. See how the, the center just sits right in there. You tap it up real tight. And this will give you the ability to bore a long, non-wandering hole. And that's the trick here. We're going to bore a hole, and it should come out dead center through there. Now, the kind of bit we're going to use that keeps it from wandering is this right here. It's called a, uh, here's another one, actually. It can, may, may have a little more meat left on it. These are just about worn out and hard to get. It's called a shell auger. Just about any kind of auger will, will do. But these are best because they won't wander around in hard and soft grain. So all I do is just feed that through there. Right, I've got a little hand vise on the end to hold it. And you start cranking it around. All right, now be ready. <laughs> Be ready. You may want to take us uh, tie a fan right here to keep yourself cooled down. Ooh, squeaking terribly. Mm. Keep yourself cooled down as you do this. And you got to put beeswax in there to keep this from chirping so much. But here, let me take it on out. You can see some of the, the shavings are coming there. I'm going to try loosening up a little bit. Maybe it won't squeak so much. Dump the shavings. But this kind of auger will go a long way. Oh, Ooh, that's terrible. Oh, oh. That's, that's worse than the worst uh, uh, playing you can do. That just needs beeswax in there to make that stop. What you do next then is uh, take longer and longer augers and work your way on down. Let me try that back and see if indeed that was the problem. You always, yeah, hear it now? You don't hear it now, do you? All right. So you take the auger and just keep working down. It takes a while. And if you have a flywheel lathe or any other kind of lathe, it'll go very, very fast. And of course, you want to be careful. Uh, any lathe can really hurt you. So always keep your head off to the side so if it flies out, you don't get clobbered by something flying out of the lathe and knocking you one. All right, let's see how much boring it's done here. You can see, yeah, see, it's cutting its way on in there. So you just keep at that, keep it at it and pretty soon you'll be down as far as you can reach with this. All right, then, because it's a tapered auger, you use a series of bits. Here would be the next one. This is an electrician's bit, and you work it down inside there after you've done the other one. See? And it, again, it should stay pretty well centered, so keep it down in there until it bottoms out. You don't want to touch the point on the far end. Keep that on down and then widen it up on the other end. In other words, you're using a series of augers. Now, this is the final step. Take it out of the lathe and use a bigger auger to ream it even wider because you're making a tapered cylinder. And a lot of people who've studied old instruments find out that instead of being a funnel shape, a very smooth uh, reducing diameter, it stepped. And of course, that was because they used a series of augers like this and then tried to smooth it by rasping the inside or making a some, something else inside there, a scraper to smooth up the inside. All right. So you get to 
a smooth cylinder in the lathe that you then uh, turn down after you're done uh, to this uh, beautiful uh, proportion here. Again, copying uh, the one that you have with you. And always turn this tenon last, the piece that's going to go in there. What you do is uh, you've got a plug stuck inside here, I guess something like that. Uh, but see how fragile it is right here? Turn that last uh, it's because it's the weakest point. Then, of course, take it all over to your bench. Your final step that you have to do is bore the finger holes. But bore them small, no matter which one you're copying. Even if you're absolutely able to copy them perfectly, bore very small holes into it. And then, starting at the bottom, enlarge them because that lowers the note a little bit. Anyway, you have to just work your way up and do it bit by bit. Well, I'm sure you're going to enjoy making it as much as I have, and I sure appreciate you joining me. I hope to see you again next time here in the Woodwright Shop. This is Roy Underhill. So long. Tonight at 8, we're enlarging the living room, and that means removing a wall on this old house. Then at 8.30, Say Brother looks at a new idea in urban development.